I'd like you to turn with me this morning, if you would, to the 49th chapter, the 49th chapter of Genesis. And I just, uh, I want to look at just the last part of this 49th chapter. So if you look with me, I want to pick up our reading in verse 29. Genesis 49, verse 29, we'll read down to the end, 33. Genesis 49, verse 29. This is Jacob speaking, really, on his deathbed. Okay? Have you ever been around the deathbed of a loved one? My son Jonathan, his wife Kiernan, she's around her mother's deathbed right now. Here's Jacob's words on his deathbed, having spoken to all of his, his children. He says in verse 29, He charged them and said unto them, I am to be gathered unto my people. Note that phrase. Gathered unto my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre, in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field of Ephron the Hittite for a possession of a burying place. There they buried Abraham and Sarah his wife, and they buried Isaac and Rebekah his wife, and there I buried Leah. The purchase of the field and of the cave that is therein was from the children of Heth, and when Jacob had made an end of commanding his sons, he gathered up his feet into the bed, and he yielded it up the ghost, that is his human spirit, and was gathered unto his people. Note that last phrase in verse 50. And was gathered unto his people. The same phrase that uh, we saw in verse 29 where he says, I am to be gathered unto my people. Two times that phrase is repeated in those few verses. And some people argue that that's just a Hebrew euphemism for death, or it is uh, simply a desire to be buried in the burial plot of his ancestors. But I think the implication of that phrase, twice repeated, is much more than that. I believe what he's saying is that at the moment of death, the human soul is immediately carried to be reunited with the souls of their ancestors in heaven. I believe that that twice repeated phrase is actually an early statement of an expression of life after death. I want to talk to you about life after death based upon Jacob's being gathered unto his people. Do you believe in life after death? Not everyone does. Jacob obviously did. Genesis chapter 49, verse 29 and verse 33, gathered unto his people. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're very grateful to be here this morning and we thank you for the hope that we have that this life is not all there is, that there is more to come. But because of that, we need to be prepared for it. And I pray that every single one, whether here in person or listening via the internet, will come to a place, if they have not already, where they are trusting Jesus, and thus they know that they have eternal life and a home in heaven. And I pray, Lord, that you would use your word today as only you can. Grant it the power of that two-edged sword that goes so deep it can dissect between soul and spirit and it can lay bare then the very motives, the very thoughts and motives of the heart. I pray to that end that you may be glorified. And I do so on the basis of being in Jesus, our Savior. Amen. 
I mentioned and I asked you if you believe that there is a life after death. Do you believe in an afterlife? Let me tell you something. If there is a God, there is an afterlife. I don't know if you have thought about this, but God is a spirit. Which means that there is something more to life than just the physical. Just the tangible, something you can touch. Just the material, something that you can see. God is a spirit. And every human being has a part, there's a part of you that is immaterial. A part of you that is not tangible. A part of you that cannot be seen. Every human being has a soul. And that soul part of you is spiritual. And that in itself says something that this physical life, there's got to be more to it than just this physical life. You know, think about this. Our lives and our world are just full of injustices and suffering and the only way that uh, the only way that that will ever be put right the only way that uh, there is any comfort for the pain that people suffer and the death that we all are going to face is if there's an afterlife and I'm telling you atheistic evolution has no answer to this they have no answer to suffering and pain. That's why they always bring that up as a, as a, as a big wall in their non-belief of God because of suffering. Because they have no answer for it. If death ends at all, there are no answers. There is no justice. There is no reason. In fact, Without an afterlife, our lives here are totally meaningless. They really have no point. It's just a, a, a random crapshoot, if you will. It's just a pointless gamble if there's no afterlife. And I think that that has to fit into the increased suicides that we see in our nation because our culture has voided God from it. And as a result, there's no purpose in life because there's no afterlife if there's no God. That means that people that torture other people get away with it. They get away with their horrible deeds. And that means that people that are seriously abused and tortured, they are never given justice. There's never any retaliation. There's never any restitution. And again, I think the underlying reason why we see such massive evil in America, which, in, which would include not just the, the uh, shootings and the stabbings, but the horrible holocaust of abortion. The reason we see such mass evil in America is because we've driven God out of our culture. And when there is no fear of God put before the people, the people do whatever they feel like doing. The people live the way they want to live. And they assume that they're going to be able to skate in the end because this is all there is. There's no afterlife. And if there's no afterlife, then there's no accountability. <clears throat> if there's a God, there's an afterlife. Let me give you just some simple evidences of an afterlife. Nature itself indicates that, that there's more. Winter always yields to spring. Death yields to a period of life. An ugly caterpillar turns into a beautiful butterfly in nature, in anthropology, in the study of mankind. People that study different cultures and societies reveal that it is inherent in every human culture that there is just an innate belief in immortality. That is, that 
there is an ongoing existence in some form or another. May not line up with what we believe in the Bible, but that is just part of being a human being. There's more. It's innate in us. There's a sense, there's an inward desire in every human heart for something more than just mortal life. For something more than just this here and now. And when you think about justice, there's got to be a time when good is going to be re rewarded and evil is going to be punished. But if there's no afterlife, nothing. I think the greatest proof that there's an afterlife is that someone died and came back again. And his name is Jesus. And there is historical evidence of that outside of the Bible. And we need not to be ashamed of the fact that we believe in a bodily resurrection of Jesus the Messiah. I mean, if it could be disproved, don't you think that in 2,000 years, with that ample amount of time, that it would be completely debunked by now, if it was a myth? No book has ever been under such attack as the Bible. And no part of the Bible, like the resurrection of Jesus the Messiah, has ever come under such scrutiny and attack. And yet, it stands. Both the Bible and the resurrection. And the resurrection of Jesus himself, he died, he proved that he was alive, and as a result, there is a life after death. As I said, if there's a God, there's an afterlife. Let me just briefly touch on some explanations for the reason people deny an afterlife. I think, first of all, because there's a lot of people that are angry. They're angry at God. They're bitter against God. And they're bitter because their life isn't working out the way they thought it should. And uh, they have no promise for any future hope either. And so they're just angry. And they're just mad, and they're mad at God. I really think that uh, the disbelief in an afterlife is just a smokescreen. It is really, they want to reject an afterlife. They want to refuse anyone, including God, telling them what they can and cannot do, what is right and what is wrong. And so, if we can just get rid of the afterlife, then I don't have to answer to anyone. I can live the way I want. I can do what I want to do. I want to warn you. If you're in that category, there comes a time when you need to be challenged. You need to be challenged to say, okay, God, I don't believe in you, I don't believe in what you say, I don't believe in your afterlife, and I want you to get out of my life and leave me alone and never talk to me again. Never bother me again. Are you bold enough to take that kind of a stand with God? I warn you that if you do, God may very well do that. He may totally and permanently leave you alone. I'm not saying do it. I'm just saying that there comes a time that perhaps you need to be challenged along those lines. If you're so big and you think there is no God and there's no afterlife, if you think you are such a person that can stand and raise your fist against God, then tell him to leave you alone and never t talk to you again. Is that where you want to live? Is that where you want to be? If there is a God... There is an afterlife. Here's my second and final point, and it's this. I believe there's an afterlife. Mm -hmm. Jacob obviously believed it. He believed in being gathered to his people. That is, those of his family members that went before him and were alive in heaven. He said, I'm going to be gathered to them. He believed in an afterlife. Now, I want to say this. I believe in an afterlife. If there's a God, there's an afterlife. And secondly, if there's an afterlife, there's a resurrection. If there's an afterlife, there's a resurrection. Take your Bible with me, if you would, please. 
And go over with me to Matthew chapter 22. This is the ministry of Jesus. This is when he walked this earth. Matthew chapter 22. And he had a lot of opponents. And what they loved to do is try to trap him in his words, in an argument, paint him in a corner where then they would discredit him. Or they would make him say something that would get him in trouble with uh, either the religious uh, authorities or the Roman government that Israel was ruled by in those days. That's what's going on in Matthew chapter 22. And it says in verse 23, the same day came to him the Sadducees. Now the Sadducees were the rulers at the temple. They were the, the Jewish religious leaders that ruled the temple. The Sadducees, they came to Jesus, and here's what they, they, uh, the, the, they say. The Sadducees did not believe in a resurrection. Do you believe in a resurrection? You know, there are people that believe in an afterlife, but they don't believe in a resurrection. I'm going to show you this is different. There's a difference between just accepting an afterlife versus a resurrection. These men, though religious leaders, did not believe in the resurrection of the body. They did not believe in a bodily resurrection. And so, here's what they say. They come to him in verse 24. Master... Moses said, if a man die having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up children unto his brother. That was called leveret, uh, uh, leveret law. It was making sure that uh, your brother, your family member, did not die childless because the inheritance was to be passed on, right? And so they set up a scenario because they want to catch him and disprove the resurrection of the body. Verse 25, now there were with us seven brethren. The first, he married a wife, deceased, and having no issue, no, ch no child, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise, the second also, he died and didn't produce a child. The third, and then verse 26, unto seven, there are seven brothers. None of them produced a, a child. So here's the, here's the kicker of their question in verse 28. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. Oh, aren't they clever? <laughs> Jesus answers them in verse 29 and says, You do err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection... They neither marry nor are given in marriage. There is not physical family life in heaven. Sorry. And then he goes on to say this. But they are as the angels of God in heaven. Okay? Verse 31. But as touching the resurrection of the dead... Have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, and here is a quote from the book of Exodus, chapter 3, twice, verse 6 and verse 16, where God says to Abraham, that's when Abraham, or, or not Abraham, Moses is called at the burning bush. And uh, have you not read what uh, was spoken to uh, by God saying I am notice this the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob he doesn't say at the burning bush when he meets Moses I was the God of Abraham I was the God of Isaac I was the God of no I am present tense continual have you not read that when I met Moses, I said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And then this, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Now let's uh, think about that for a moment. When God introduced himself to Moses at that burning bush, 
He was not just in the past, but he was still the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Present tense, I am. Though those men died hundreds of years earlier, he was still their God. In other words, there must be an afterlife. There must be a life after death. Because he says, I am still the God of those three men that died hundreds of years earlier. But Jesus, in the 32nd verse, takes it even a, uh, to, to the next level. Look at what he does. He connects an afterlife with the bodily resurrection. He says... God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And this is in the context of talking about the resurrection. A bodily resurrection. Don't miss that. Immortality is simply a word that means the soul life of an individual, not the body, but the soul life of an individual continuing on. That's not what's being discussed here. The resurrection is being discussed here. So the question is, the Sadducees didn't have a problem with soul life continuing, with immor immortality. What they're questioning is the body being raised. And so when he talks about uh, resurrection here, Obviously, he's not talking about merely the continuation of soul life. What's being raised here is the body of these men, is what he's referring to. What triggered the exodus from Egypt? Do you remember? I'm not going to take you back there, but I think it's in Exodus chapter 2, and uh, in verse 24... God says to Moses, I have heard the cry of my people, and I have remembered the covenant that I made with Abraham. I remember the covenant that I made with uh, my people Israel. And that was the thing that triggered the exodus. That's why he called Moses to be the deliverer of Israel out of Egypt. It was that he remembered his covenant promise to Abraham and to his descendants. What was the purpose then of the Exodus? It was simply to fulfill that covenant that God made with Abraham and with the Jewish people. In fact, let me go back for a moment to Exodus chapter 3 and listen, if you will, as God calls uh, Moses to be the deliverer. Listen to what he says here. Moreover, I said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was a, a, afraid to look on God. And then the next verse, verse 7, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And then he says, And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land, and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites. When Jesus deals with these resurrection deniers, he takes them back to the call of Moses. When God calls Moses to be Israel's deliverer from Egypt, the Exodus. And the thing that triggered the Exodus and the purpose of the Exodus was that God was fulfilling his promise to give Israel a special land. God had a promised land for the Israelites. It's called Canaan in those verses. God was fulfilling his covenant promise to put them in that promised land. That's what the Exodus is about. Very interesting. Though Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob possessed soul life in heaven, 
They never lived to possess the promised land. In fact, the writer of Hebrews says, these all died in faith, have, having not received the promises. They had the land promised to them, but they never, they never received that land. And so, in order for God to fulfill His covenant promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they would have to have a resurrection. It, it would necessitate a resurrection in order for them to be able to have that promised land, uh, the place that they would dwell in. And so, when Jacob says, hey, I don't want to be buried in Egypt. I want you to bury me in the place that Abraham buried his wife and he's buried. I want to be buried in that, uh, that spot. I want to be buried really in Canaan. That, that is really an act of faith on the part of Jacob. He has faith in a future resurrection. He is awaiting a resurrection in the promised land. He has faith in the biblical promises of God. And that is a great picture for us to, to think about here, that uh, faith in the Bible promise, in the Bible promise of a resurrection, is what gives every single believer hope for the future. What's the big deal? Why not just get buried in Egypt? Why carry the body all the way to Canaan? That was an act of faith. God promised them that land. And when, he, when the resurrection happened, he wanted to be in that land that God would fulfill his promise concerning. It was all based on the word of God. And our future hope of a resurrection is based on the promise of God. That's it. Do you believe God? Can you take God as his word? Has God ever lied? Would God ever lead you astray? If there's an afterlife, there's a resurrection, folks. And I think if you believe that, if you believe God, you must believe in an, in an afterlife. And if you believe in an afterlife, you have to take it a step uh, farther than merely immortality of the soul. You have to believe in a bodily resurrection in the future. And in doing so, you exercise resurrection hope. And that's what I want to call you to. I want you to exercise resurrection hope today based upon your belief, your faith in what God says in His Word. And we read in the Scripture that the resurrection of Jesus the Messiah guarantees the resurrection of every single child of God, every believer. Listen to these verses. I'm reading in, uh, now in 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 12, now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, then how say some of you that there's no resurrection of the dead? Because if there's no resurrection from the dead, then you're saying that Christ isn't risen. And if Christ isn't risen, then our preaching's empty, it's futile, it's vain. And your faith also is empty. Uh, and, uh, and then we're found liars because we've preached that uh, God raised up the Messiah from the dead. And, and then he goes on to say in verse 20, But now is Christ risen from the dead, and he is merely the firstfruits of them that slept. And so we're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, because Christ is risen... If you're a believer, your bodily resurrection is absolutely guaranteed. It's 100% ironclad. It's going to happen. You need to exercise resurrection hope based upon what the Bible says. That Christ's resurrection guarantees your resurrection. And also, our Lord's resurrection guarantees that you are one day going to be reunited with all of your loved ones. Friends, family, you're going to be reunited with them. We read it in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and uh, verses 14 through 17. That if Christ, if you believe that Christ is raised from the dead, then all those that have died in Christ will God bring with him. 
and we will be united or reunited, I might say, together with the Lord and with those friends and loved ones in Christ in the clouds. That's what the Bible teaches. And so exercise resurrection hope based upon the Word of God, a God who cannot lie that your resurrection, if you're a believer, is absolutely guaranteed and you're reuniting with other loved ones and friends that have gone on before you is guaranteed also. In fact, we are told in that same fourth chapter of 1 Thessalonians that knowing these things ought to be a comfort to your heart. You ought to comfort one another with these words. That you're guaranteed resurrection and you're guaranteed reuniting reunion with your loved ones. Exercise resurrection hope. And once you do that, then you can extend resurrection hope to other people. I think that funerals are probably the greatest time that we are ever given to discuss death and eternity. And if we let that opportunity go by, we have, we have really, we failed. We've missed it. I make it my business to never, never allow a funeral to happen without the gospel going forth in some form, as simple as possible. It's a great opportunity. Extend res resurrection hope, not only at funerals, but extend it to people. There's a lot of people that are hopeless. They don't have any reason for living. And some, they don't think that uh, there's much hope for the afterlife either. They don't believe in it. Extend resurrection hope to them. I want to read a... a a story to you, a true story from a book called The Last Thing We Talk About. And in that book we're introduced to a godly man by the name of Joseph Bailey. And Joseph Bailey was acquainted with, with sorrow. He lost three children. But he also knew the hope that the believer has in the Lord. The day after he and his wife buried their five-year-old boy, who died of leukemia, Joseph Bailey went to thank the doctor who had been so kind to them through their ordeal. And as he sat in the waiting room, the receptionist called him over and whispered that a little boy playing in the waiting room had the same problem as his son had had. So Bailey sat down next to the boy's mother and they were far enough away from the boy that they could talk. And he said, quote, it's hard bringing him in here every two weeks for these tests, isn't it? Bailey didn't ask a question, he stated a fact. Hard? She was silent for a moment. I die every time, and now he's beginning to sense that something's wrong, her voice trailed off. It's good to know, isn't it? Bailey spoke slowly, choosing his words with unusual care. That even the medical outlook, even though the medical outlook is hopeless. We can have hope for our children in such a situation. We can be sure that after our child dies, he will be completely removed from sickness and suffering and everything like that and completely well and happy with the Lord. If I could only believe that, the woman replied, but I don't. When he dies, I'll just have to cover him up with dirt and forget I ever had him. She went back to watching her little boy push a toy car on the floor. I'm glad I don't feel that way. Bailey didn't want to say it, but he felt compelled. Why? This time the woman didn't turn toward Bailey. She just kept watching her child. Because we covered our little boy up with dirt yesterday afternoon. And I'm in here to thank the doctor for his kindness today. You look like a rational person. Bailey was glad that she didn't say, I'm sorry. She was looking straight at him now. How can you possibly believe that the death of a man or a little boy is any different from the death of an animal? 
although Bailey ends the story here, I'm sure that he went on to tell her the basis for his hope in Christ. If you believe that there is a God, there is an afterlife. And if you believe in an afterlife, there's a resurrection. Do you have hope? Do you have this kind of hope? Do you have resurrection hope? If you don't, you can. The Bible says that people that have this kind of resurrection hope, they grieve. They grieve at the time of death, but they don't grieve, they don't sorrow like people who don't have any hope. We have hope. We have all the hope now and forever. If you don't have hope, you can. If you have deceived yourself or allowed someone else to deceive you into thinking there is no afterlife, I feel sorry for you. But I also am here to once again tell you that you've been deceived. Because there is a God who has given you an immortal soul that will never die, that will be consciously alive, the Bible says, for all eternity, and either in heaven or hell. On top of that, not only will you have an immortal soul that lives forever, but you will be given a resurrection body, and that body will be able to enjoy either the, the eternal joy of being in the Lord's presence in heaven forever, or the eternal torment of being in a lake of fire, separated from God and all that is good and lovely, suffering forever. You say, that's an awful thing, but there's a way out. There's a choice that each one of us have. And you can make that choice if you haven't already. You can make that choice today. You can choose to reject the deception that perhaps you, ha perhaps you have bought into and have latched onto for way too long. You can believe that God is who the Bible says He is. You can, you can take the forgiveness that this God provides for you. And He does that through His Messiah, Jesus, Yeshua. And when you receive Him personally, you are believing that He, as Isaiah 53, which we read already this morning, says, He became sin for you. He took all of your sin in His body up on that tree and He suffered. All your iniquity was laid on Him. He was chastised for your sin. He was bruised for your iniquity. And as a result, when you receive Him, you get God's forgiveness. And that's the only way. And then you have more than an afterlife. You have heaven forever. And you have that resurrection hope and also that hope of reunion. So you make a choice today if you haven't. And if you've made the right choice and the Lord is your personal Savior, then I'm saying exercise that resurrection hope regardless of what the situation looks like. That resurrection hope, really, resurrection power is, is ultimately seen in a completely transformed body, a new body. Yes. But it's seen now in powerful Christian living. You have the resurrection power of God himself living in you if you're a believer in the person of the Holy Spirit. And he can break the bonds of any sin that has been destroying your mind and your life and your relationships. He can do it. Resurrection power. More power than a jumbo jet. More power than SpaceX. More power than anything else imaginable in this world. The power to take a body that is in dust and ashes 
and rebuild it and recreate it and animate it and give it life that never ends. Resurrection hope. You have it, exercise it, and extend it to others. There are people that are dying in sin that need you to extend resurrection hope to them. Our Heavenly Father, I'm thankful that Jacob was a man that believed in not just the immortality of the soul, but he believed in the bodily resurrection. That's why he wanted to be buried in that promised land where he would be raised to enjoy the covenant promises that you made to him and his ancestors. Lord, we have wonderful, precious promises that are given to us who are believers in Jesus. Let us believe them today. Let us have the hope of the resurrected Messiah filling us and moving in and through our lives that he might be seen and that he might be glorified. We pray it in his name. We're going to sing a closing uh, song here. And as we do, it's uh, come to the cross. As we sing come to the cross, I want you to think about the words. And if you've never come to the cross, you've never come to Jesus for forgiveness and salvation, do so today, will you?